Hello, my name is Jessica Burns. Um, I'm an extension educator with Ohio State University Extension in Benton County. I cover two program areas. That would be agriculture, natural resources, and also community development. And today what we're gonna be discussing is non-native invasive spe species, particularly in a forested setting. So if you take a look behind me, you can see I'm just sitting here on the edge of a forest. We've got a lot of birds nearby that you can probably hear in the background. But we're going to be talking about the different non-native invasive species that could kind of occur here. So when you think about that, non-native invasive species can come in all shapes and sizes. So they can be plants, they can be animals, they could also be diseases. And, you know, within the plants, animals, they can be all different sizes. You know, you can have insects, you could have mammals. With the plants, you can have small plants growing on the ground, or you can have big trees. There can be all different shapes and sizes when it comes to these invasive species. So speaking about um, all different shapes and sizes, so let's talk about non-native diseases. So in the past, we've had some issues with non-native invasive diseases in forest settings. So if you've ever heard of the American chestnut, uh, there was a non-native invasive disease that happened here in the United States called the chestnut blight. And the American chestnut was a really important tree species to our native ecosystems. It, was, uh, it had provided a huge economic benefit to the region. Um, it also was readily used by all different types of wildlife. And when the chestnut blight was introduced into the United States, it practically decimated the American chestnut population. There's millions and millions of dollars that are going into research to bring back the chestnut tree because it was decimated by a non-native invasive disease. And if you think about animals, we've also had non-native invasive animals. So I'm sure we've all heard of the emerald ash borer. So this became an issue, you know, back in the early 2000s when there was a whole campaign to not move firewood. So the emerald ash borer was a detrimental insect to the ash tree. You know, it killed a lot of ash tree all across the area. I know the ash tree in my backyard was killed by emerald ash borer. I'm sure all of you have dealt with a similar situation. But, you know, that's one example of a non-native invasive insect that has happened here in forested settings in Ohio. We also have a new one that's up and coming, and it's called the spotted lanternfly. And this spotted lanternfly is a pretty important invasive species that can target apple trees or also grapevines. So it's pretty important to the apple industry or the grape industry. But we can also see it in forested settings where it will lay its eggs and, you know, it plays into that whole life cycle and, you know, how we might be able to control it. So when it comes to invasive plants, um, you know, we could have shrubs, we could have herbaceous plants that grow really low to the ground. We can also have trees. There's all different shapes, all different types. But um, the one thing I really want to mention is that particularly what we're talking about today is going to be non-native invasive plants. So you can have invasive plants or plants, native plants that have invasive growth form. So um, for whatever particular reason, you can have native plants that just start growing out of control and out competing all of the rest of the plants in the environment. But what we're talking about is non-native plants. So there are plants that are not native to Ohio, southeastern, southern Ohio, and they're invasive in growth form. So what that means is basically they have a couple traits. So non-native invasive plants are really competitive. They really are good at competing for nutrients, light, water, the kind of things that plants rely on, and they are out competing the native plants, which are adapted to living here. Um, one other thing about non-native invasive plants is that because they haven't evolved here in this natural ecosystem, they don't have a natural predator. So think of a plant, it might have a native disease to this area that you know is used to killing so many of the plants to keep the ecosystem in balance. It might also have a animal predator in the form of an insect or a mammal, something that likes to eat it, that will also help to keep that population in balance. But for those non-natives that aren't here or aren't from here, they don't have the natural predators that are keeping the population in control and allowing them to, you know, not take over huge areas. This is what is allowing them to just form huge swaths of just monoculture, one plant. 
So, you know, it's really important when we talk about this, you have to realize that everything in our environment is connected, right? We all learned like the food chain, everything's connected when we were in elementary school, but it's really the truth. You know, all of our native wildlife are adapted to relying on things like native plants. Even if we just take the flowers into consideration, the pollen or the nectar source of non-native flowers is not as nutritious to our pollinators as that of our native plants. So even just small scenarios like that, you know, it's really important to the health of our environment that we have native plants growing here and not non-native plants. So I want you to keep that in mind. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is just discuss a couple of non-native plants that I can see here around me today. But I just want you guys to keep in mind that, you know, this happens a lot. Um, we bring plants here because we find a use for them or we like how pretty they look, but they often escape into our native environment and they start to compete with the native plants for all of those valuable resources that occur in an ecosystem. So I'll discuss that and I'm in the next couple of plants, but I also just want you to be certain that a lot of this is from our doing. A lot of these plants are here because we brought them here. So, you know, it's important that we try to do our best to eradicate them because, you know, it's we've always learned it's best to right our wrongs. So it's best to try to restore our natural environment to how it's meant to be. So go ahead and we'll go through some non-native invasive species that you guys can identify. So down here to my right, we have a really common plant that's found all across Ohio, pretty much all across the United States. And it's called Multiflora Rose. A lot of you are probably already really familiar with it. Um, I know most people have probably gotten snagged on it a time or two, at least in their life. But based on its name, you know, it's called multiflora rose. That means multiple flowers. So you can see we have multiple flowers on each stem. That's um, a good distinct characteristic of it. But if you also look closely, we'll see if we can get it on the video here. We have what's called a fringe stipule right here. So right where the leaf meets the stem, we have a lot of, they almost look like hairs coming out. And if you see that characteristic, it's really um, indicative that what you're looking at is multiflora rose, but it is a non-native invasive species. It's native to um, some Asian countries and it was actually brought here to be useful to us as a living fence. So it was brought over because it forms these really dense thickets in a way that um, you could use it to block off things like different areas of your pasture land and you wouldn't have to, you know, dig fence posts, put up fence, maintain fences in that way. But unfortunately, just like we hear all the time, it escaped out into the native environment and now it takes over a lot of different areas. So, in, you know, this is a pretty small patch, but they can reach up to about 15 feet in length and they'll grow really high and the canes will kind of start to arc over and sometimes they'll even touch the ground, regroup, and then start the whole thing over again. So that's the reason they were brought over for those living fences. But unfortunately, they're just out here in the native environment competing with the species we really like. Um, but I'm sure you all, if you didn't know how to identify it already, now you know how and you can go out there and try to start managing it. Here we have another non-native invasive species. Um, and before we had the multiflora rose, which, you know, kind of arcs and canes, this is more of a shrub to a small tree growth form. And this is called autumn olive. Uh, I'm sure all of you have probably seen an autumn olive before, even if you didn't know what it was. And it's really particular, you can see it, especially in times like this when, you know, it's been raining a little bit, the branches are kind of flipped, or if it's a windy day, because the underside of the leaves are silver so they have this gray silver tone they have like some scales that give them that color but you can especially see it on this small plant you know versus if you look at it from the top to the bottom it has a noticeable color change so it's really easy to identify because of that but if you notice this autumn olive has been cut before so in fact we have several autumn olive species or plants here where we're at today and they were all planted as ornamentals 
Um, they're just scattered around here clearly in the landscape, but they've been tried to, people have obviously tried to control them. They've been cut, but they have this really invasive growth form and all of this has grown back after they tried to remove it once before. So this is one of the reasons it can be really hard to control is because if you do cut it, it's just gonna re-sprout from the bottom and it's just gonna create a whole new plant again. So um, it does have a lookalike, which is Russian olive. They're kind of difficult to tell apart. Their seeds are a little bit, um, they're a different color and then the leaves are slightly different as well, but they're, they pretty much grow in similar habitats. Here in Southeast Ohio, I often see autumn olive growing on disturbed, um, reclaimed mine land. So in those areas where the land has been reclaimed after mining, you know, the soil isn't always the best quality, but autumn olive really thrives there. In some cases, I only see grass growing, you know, lower to the, the floor there. And then basically all of the tall plants are just autumn olive because it can really thrive in those disturbed environments. You know, it's awful common on forest edges, um, pasture land, any disturbed areas. But even just from these ornamental plants, which have been planted here, we can see it all across here in this whole landscape, all of these really tall brushy areas. That is all autumn olive that has been spread by the fruits. So these plants will have red fruits. They're pretty small and they're in clusters of four to six and the birds really like to eat them. So the birds will come, they'll eat the autumn olive fruits and then they'll scatter the seeds through their droppings. So you can see all of this whole area is full of autumn olive and it has just come from these ornamental plants that have been planted here. So as you can imagine, we could have a whole slew of native species that would be thriving here in this low creek bed. But instead, because this autumn olive plant was planted right here many years ago, we now have a whole lot of autumn olive growing here instead of our native species, which we really like and enjoy and other animals really rely on. So here at the base of this tree, we have another invasive, non-native invasive species I'd like to go over. And this is called Japanese honeysuckle. And this is the plant we're looking at in particular right here. So you can go ahead and take a look at the way it's growing on this tree. It's kind of vining and you can see it's attached itself. It's growing in multiple locations, but I'm going to go ahead and pull it up not only so we can get rid of it, but also so I can show you some of the particular growth habits on it. So when this plant is really young, it's pretty easy to pull it up by the roots. I could have gotten a little bit of a better grip and pulled more of the root up there, but let's go ahead and take a look at what's going on. So as you can see, um, we've got one sim starting out down here, but then it's starting to branch off and it's almost like strawberries, the way that they produce runners. So this plant is producing runners that will then in turn go produce it, their own runners. And so this is gonna, the way it's gonna make a really bushy growth form and the way it's going to spread really far. Um, so if you look closely, one thing you'll notice is that there are two different leaves growing on, leaf types growing on this plant. So here at the bottom, we have leaves that almost look like an oak. So, this is what the leaf shape looks like at the very bottom of the plant. And then once we get up here, the leaves are oval. So down here, they have pretty deep lobes. That's what we call those kind of indentations in the leaf that make it look like an oak. So it's pretty smooth. It has these lobes, but up here, the leaves are really smooth and they're completely oval. And, um, this plant can be really easy to identify because of that, but you won't always be able to see both different growth forms. And Japanese honeysuckle is pretty famous for having the white or yellow flowers that I know when I was a kid, we would go around and you would pull it off of the plant and pull the base of the, the flower out there and get that one little droplet of nectar that you would put right onto your tongue and it was really sweet. So that is what comes from these plants. Those are what the flowers look like. Um, but it's really common in areas like this. So you can see we're on the edge of a woodland. We're right beside a road. So this is a pretty disturbed area and it's just growing right up this fence. 
And there's also some behind these lower trees and shrubs growing down into the creek side. But it really favors areas like this. It can tolerate shade more than some of the other non-native invasive species we've talked about. But um, it does like to prefer, it prefers full sun. It can tolerate areas like this though. And it can actually be really difficult to control when it's really big. Um, but like I said, when it's small like this, it's best to just pull it up and get a hold of it. You know, while it's still manageable, you can pull out these small shoots and hopefully it won't cause you a big problem in the future.